Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this edition of the Hand Internet Live session from the members of the AO North America Hand Education Committee. We are delighted that you could join us, and this is the 12th out of 14 sessions, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. So, uh, Today we have uh, two sessions, as usual. My job today is to talk about tendon ruptures about the wrist, and Paul Benhammer is going to talk about management of uh, and uh, ulnar artery perforator flaps, which would be a perfect segue for the things we are dealing with. The members of the education committee are up here. Um, all the disclosures are present. They've all been resolved. We do follow Zoom etiquette. All your microphones have been muted and your videos have been turned off, but we do love to hear from you. And we love to answer your questions and share your views and our views together. So please send us your questions through the Q&A section at the bottom. Amit Gupta and Kyle Bickel will have the job of fielding your questions. So I will stop this sharing here and uh, start with next one, which will be just a minute, if I can get it to work. Okay. Let's try this again. Here we go. So like I said before, is this visible to you guys? Max, am I okay? You're great. You're going to talk about tendon ruptures about the wrist. Now, whenever you talk about tendon ruptures about the wrist, Knowing your anatomy and the intimacy of the tendons to the bones is critical in understanding what happens and why it happens. We know that there are six dorsal compartments. As you can see, they are intimately adherent to the dorsal aspect of the distal radius, as well as the DRUJ. Most commonly, we appear to have ruptures of the EPL, the EDC, and the EDQ. Now, Berksma and his colleagues did a wonderful study using MRIs, and they calculated the distance of these tendons from the dorsal cortical surface of the distal radius, and it varies from 0.5 millimeters to 3.2 millimeters. You must be wondering why we don't talk about the APL and the EPB. It appears that they don't seem to rupture as frequently. In fact, they're quite rare, although there are case reports. How about the flexor side? On the flexor side, you have the FPL and the FTP most commonly rupturing. And again, the same colleagues, Berksma and colleagues, they looked at this and they found that at the watershed line, these tendons are about three to five millimeters volar. Lim Thon Tang and uh, Dr. Osterman's group, they looked at where the location of the FPL tendon would be in relationship to the volar cortex of the distal radius at the level of the watershed line. And what they found was, if you look at this, the, the white blob here is the FPL tendon, and it's about 54% of the width from the under side of the radius to the radial side at the level of the watershed line. Which means there's a good reason why plates placed inappropriately can affect these tendons. But that's too simplistic. So why do tendons rupture? Well, we do know that they rupture spontaneously and we'll talk about that a little later. But spontaneous ruptures largely seem to affect the extensive surface. More commonly, we see them after distal radius fractures, which are undisplaced. And we used to think that they were uncommon at 0.2 to 0.5% or maybe a couple percent at the most until Kevin Roth and colleagues came up with this paper a few years ago where they found a 5% incidence. So the reality is that the incidence lies somewhere in between. Now, what about the main thing that causes ruptures in today's day and age? It's fracture fixation of the distal radius with plates placed volarly. Now, it's about 0.3, 0.8% uh, in a nice uh, review, which Azzy and colleagues did in PRS 2016. Not surprisingly, they found that the rupture of the EDC was far more common when plates were placed dorsally. Now, that's what we do, but what about other conditions? Well, rheumatoid arthritis comes to mind, and even osteoarthritis, if it causes a proliferate of synovial hypertrophy of the DRUJ. It can affect the EPL on the radial side. And on the other side, it commonly uh, affects the EDQ and the EDC of the small digit. 
Now, when it comes to rare instances, there are also gymnasts who work on uneven bars. And while they are going from one bar to another, you have to let go at a high speed. But if your hand stays in contact while your body keeps turning, eccentric forces are generated, leading to avulsion of your extensors. So when do they rupture? Usually within the first three months after distal radius fractures. And not surprisingly, women are affected twice as much as men. After open reduction of a distal radius fracture and placement of a volar plate, ruptures can happen at any time, depending on where you place your plate in relationship to the zoom line shown by this arrow. However, the data is not conclusive about that. In rheumatoid osteoarthritis, by and large, the onset of symptoms of rupture happens more than 10 years after the diagnosis has been made. I have to thank uh, my good friend Amit Gupta for this beautiful picture. And the pathoanatomy consists of bleeding, fibrosis, and callus within the substance of the tight retinaculum, which we saw before. Now, Hirasawa and colleagues showed us nearly 30 years ago that the extrinsipolysis longus is not a well-perfused tendon. And in fact, at the level of the third compartment, there is a watershed area with very poor vascularity. You combine that with errant drilling from the volar side or a prominent screw in the, in the floor of the third compartment, then you realize that this tendon is very, very vulnerable. Now, Nitro and colleagues looked at this in 2017, and they, they did a CT analysis of fracture lines which extend to the base of the third compartment. And what they found was 88% of these patients had an injury to the EPL. Now, I must say that when they found that the fracture line extended to the floor of the third compartment on the CT, they opened up the third compartment and took a look at the EPL. And you either found fibrillation as seen on this picture, or these longitudinal rents as seen in this one. Finally, you also have the Von Jackson syndrome, which was described almost 80 years ago, which consists of synovial hypertrophy causing laxity of the DRUJ, and the ulnar head dislocates dorsally. Now the panus from the synovitis de destroys the DRUJ, causing osteophytosis, which then erodes through the DRUJ capsule as seen here, and saws through the extensive mechanism. Is primary repair possible? Usually not, because these are attrition ruptures and they look like rat tails. And it's good to be not fooled by what appears to be tendon, but in actuality is a pseudo tendon with the body trying to heal it. The question is, should we use a free tendon graft or tendon transfer? And in rheumatoid arthritis, if you're doing so, you have to do synovectomy and with apologies to Dr. Shekhar, a DARA. Which is better? Graft or transfer, there is no real data to show superiority. It really boils down to your training and surgeon choice. If you find the proximal end, it's non-fibrotic and the muscle belly is still pliable, you can graft it. You have to decide whether you're comfortable with two repair zones or one repair zone. And you can do a tendon transfer if you find an available tendon with similar behavior. How do you repair it? You can either do a side-to-side -side or a pulver tact and we evaluated them in the lab. And what we found was that the side-to-side -side repair technique showed superior biomechanical properties and the bulk was comparable to that of the pulver tap wheel. So with that said, let's move on to some interesting cases. When you see an x-ray like this, soon grade two, Jeffrey, what is the one thing that bothers you if, if this person were to walk into your office? Yeah, so um, that would be one that if they started having complaints of their FPL, uh, crepitance, pain, uh, a crunching sensation I've heard from patients. Mm -hmm. uh, FPL most commonly, but could also be um, index FDP. Yeah. Now, if you were to see this person and they didn't have an obvious rupture, but if they had crepitation, would you advise them to have the plate removed? Yeah, I would. I, I mean, you know, so ideally it's three or four months after the fracture and, you know, the fracture is healed to the point where you can go ahead and, and uh, remove the plate, uh, do a little tenosynovectomy, uh, a little debridement, uh, you know, get a chance to inspect the tendons. Um, as long as you catch it early, it'll probably be something you can manage with just that. Right. So this lady is 72. She's about two years out and she came to me like this. So um, how, what is your, um, what is your uh, thought process when you see someone like this? So we're looking, it's, it's the, her left hand and she's stuck in flexion or it's her oh, right hand and right she hand. can't flex it? The right hand she can't flex. Okay. 
so she's already ruptured. Um, yeah. So again, uh, unfortunately, you didn't didn't catch her early enough to intercede. So um, tendon grafting and debridement of the uh, of the area as well as plate removal. Um, and while you're there, take a, a good look at the index FDP because it's yeah. it's sort of next next door. So you're more of a graft person, I understand, as opposed to transfer. Um, I, I think for this, I would be a graft person uh, because chances are you're going to have a, a nice uh, both donor and recipient, yes. and you're going to improve the environment for the graft uh, because you're going to get that plate out of there. Mm. Um, I understand your concerns about having two uh, junctions, yeah. uh, but again, you're going to improve the environment by removing that plate. And do you have a particular graft that you're uh, fond of? Uh, I mean, you're right there. So if she's got a palmaris longus, I would use that. If if not, uh, FCR is right there. You could take half FCR um, yeah. and then still save it for CMC arthroplasty later. Okay. So we uh, harvested the uh, palmaris, as you can see there. I'm just going to go off track for uh, just a second. Max or Doreen, if you're listening, can you send uh, Dr. Cassidy a link so he can log in, please? Okay. So going back, um, so here's the palmaris. Do you have any special tricks about what you do when you connect the two ends and how, how do you manage it? Yeah, so my order of operations, I usually will, uh, in this case, I would sew it. I mean, you've got both exposed. I would, I would probably sew it in distally, um, use a tendon passer, pass it out, um, and then set my tension proximally. So I didn't use a tendon passer. I used an infant feeding tube, but I think uh, we are all on the same page here. And your distal anastomosis, do you have a choice of um, which technique you prefer, whether you go side to side or pulver taft? Um, in this case, I, I choose pulver taft, uh, despite uh, evidence to the contrary that you presented. Um, <laughs> you know, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> but here, this is an older case. This was before we did our study. I used a pulver taft. So you didn't know any better, yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, I pulled the weave through and. Uh, uh, here I'm trying to show the setting of tension. Do you have any special tricks for the audience about how you should set tension? Uh, you know, so I'm not a, a, a huge Wallant uh, tension setter. Uh, there are some that would say, you know, do it in an awake patient uh, so that you can set tension based on their active tone. Yeah. Um, I, I have not done that and, and I've been okay with it, but I know there are people that uh, fall on that side. Um, I would, you know, want to make sure you, you certainly don't want to make it too tight. Uh, you know, so I would set the tension mid range between, you know, her, her, you know, sort of opposing to her, her small, uh, MP joint, uh, you know, and, and then being able to abduct, uh, beyond the radial border of her, of her hand. Right. So that, this is exactly the way, I mean, I do it. You flex the wrist so that the IP joint extends fully and the thumb extends fully. And then when you flex, uh, when you extend the wrist, you can see the pinch being generated at the, so basically I'm trying to help uh, generate key pinch. And that is remarkably strong. And uh, here she is, this is at about four months. She's back playing tennis. She can start her own car and generates about nine pounds of force, uh, which is reasonable. And then you might be wondering what happened to the plate. Well, you can make beautiful jewelry from it. So. So, All right. I have got a question before you go on to the next. Please, go ahead. So uh, if you did a transfer versus a, a graft, would that change yep. the rehab protocol? Uh, you know, you have two sites that, are, uh, that you're waiting to heal versus one. One's a transfer, one, uh, the other is an inter intercalary graft. Would that change your rehab protocol? Yes. So if I did a transfer, I'd be a little more aggressive with my rehab. So... Uh, and we'll see that a little bit later also. Uh, with a tendon transfer, I usually start rehabbing them at about two weeks or two and a half weeks at the most. Uh, whereas with a graft, I probably wait maybe three to four. So, and we'll, I'm going to pick, pick Becky's brain if she's around a little bit later. So, so uh, hey, um, I, this is a problem which I'm going to throw out to the audience. I mean, to, to all the faculty and you can chime in. So there's this 22 year old male who felt a snap in his thumb while he was trying to pick up something heavy. He can't flex his IP joint, doesn't have an history to the, uh, of injury to the thumb. X-rays are negative for obvious bony injury in that vicinity. 
doesn't have an inflammatory problem, but he does have a history of a lack to the ulnar side of the wrist where he had an FCU laceration of the PC form, which I had repaired a few years before. Now what do we do? And he doesn't have a functioning FPL. Do you have a choice of uh, thinking, imaging, anything that you guys can come up with? Um, Jay, Harry, Tom, anyone? I, this is Harry. I, so when, when it's a mild tenderness unit, it's mechanical or neurologic? Right. It's you know, not it's neurologic. Different. So it's not neurologic. No. So now it becomes something uh, mechanical. In other words, there's no denervation. There's no AI, AIM palsy or anything no, like no, that. No, no, no. Okay. So now it's something mechanical. Either it's ruptured, stuck, doesn't move. Yes. Something along those lines. Um, and, you know, for us, it's further imaging really we don't use a lot of ultrasound but i think ultrasound would be very helpful in this situation and so uh, we decided you know, to spend some more money more money unless so, unless the unless the exam you know you can you can pinpoint something you can feel something it's you know it's a locked trigger finger you know he had a, a a-bone pulley rupture or you know something that's you know along those lines right his exam was really really uh not conclusive for any of those so i thought maybe he had this uh, a spicule on, you know, much like a manor felt lesion. So I yep. got a CT and it didn't show that. I got an MR to look for an inflammatory or a, you know, lesion of some sort. It just showed a rupture, nothing else. What was the level of the rupture? Was it, it would you think it was in the distal part of the carpus? Yeah, if you look at the image on your right, it is from the A1 pulley downwards and the proximal end has retracted all the way down into the thenars. If you can't even yeah. see it. I think Chai, this is Peter. The, yep. the question that you had about what imaging study, yep. I think ultrasound's good and I think yep. Harry alluded to it, but when you don't know where it is, where the yep. injury is, um, I think this is, I think, a, a great example of where an MRI is helpful because then you can look along the whole course of the FPL and, and you're kind of surprised that it's, it's ruptured at this level. Right, so I had really no uh, hesitation in getting an ultrasound, but I spoke to one of our uh, sonologists who literally is next door, and they were somewhat concerned based on his clinical exam. They said, I don't know that we'll be able to see all the way down into the thenars for the proximal end. So we figured we just do one investigation. They were, they were content with giving me imaging distally, but uh, proximally they had some concerns. So we went with this. So I decided, so is it reasonable, do you think, to explore him at this point? So, we found the FPL remnant scarred from the A1 pulley distal. The proximal end was within the thenars, like I mentioned. Now, what do I do? Do I reconstruct it in a scarred bed? Do I do two stage? What are my choices here? Peter, what would you do? Well, I think that, um, you know, the, for me, I would do a two stage, um, you know, if the police system was incompetent or collapsed yeah. or it was just a in non, -hospi non hospitable uh, wound bed. But here, if it's, you know, if it's still tethered with the thenars, I think it's very reasonable and it's the A1 and distal is intact to do either a graft or a tendon transfer. And I think, I think that's the question. If it's, if we, if based on the chronicity and how much myostatic contracture there is right. to do one or the other. But I, I'm more concerned as to what, what caused it. Exactly. I, so what we did was the entire thing was so scarred in that I did not feel confident I could get a one stage done. So I, I took the soft option. I got as much tissue as I could and sent it for a path and uh, came back just showing infiltrative uh, inflamed tissue, nothing else. Uh, no sign of anything sinister. And I did what uh, I've been trained, so I put a hunter rod in. And four months later, we went back in. Now here we are, we got a hunter rod in, what next? How do we, how do we address this now? Would you go with a tendon transfer and which tendon transfer would reach that far? Uh, or would you go with the graft at this stage, Peter? Yeah, I think, um... I, I'm a fan of the tendon transfer, but you're right. I don't think um, it's difficult to get even any of the FDSs to reach down there. Yeah. Um, uh, so I would, I think um, a, uh, a tendon graft would be what I would do at this level. So um, would that be 
Would this be a procedure of choice for harvesting the graph? Yeah, Peter? Yeah, I think, um, uh, so just a, uh, a tenant strip or harvester, I think that's, I think that's very reasonable as long as you're sure that you're, get, you're getting the palmaris. But yeah, I think that sounds, uh, that's exactly what I would say. So for the audience, Peter is alluding to the possibility that in doing this, you might inadvertently harvest the median nerve. Right, Peter? Yes, exactly. Yes. And in that much as that may seem extreme, um, I think all, at least a few of us have seen cases like that, including myself. And uh, there's published data case reports about that as well. So it's not as strange as it might seem. So here we are, we got the graft, sewing it to the hunter rod, which had been placed. Any tricks for the audience, Peter? Do you uh, know I think distally uh, or approximately what is your preferred technique? I think I think exactly what you're going to do here, um, you know, to do as m little amount of uh, disruption to your to your wound bed and just um, uh, find the hunter rod up here and then um, do a, uh, you know, temporary coaptation to your hunter rod and then pull it through distally and then secure it. It's just the, uh, the tensioning can be a little uh, difficult. Um, you mean like this? Yes. Okay. So you see, we've been listening to what Peter's telling us. Now, how about this tensioning, Peter? I, I think that looks, I, I, I think that looks good. Um, you know, I, I just always wonder uh, with the chronicity of these muscle ruptures, um, you know, I, I tend to make them a little tighter because I figure the, yes. the muscles will stretch out, but it's, it's always a gamble. I just never know. Yes. So he was, um, uh, we had done the stage one at about six to seven weeks from the injury and stage two was four months later. And uh, as you saw the tension setting, he was placed in a splint and then uh, never showed up for stitch removal, never showed up for rehab, was then found at about uh, three months Somewhere the stitches had been taken out, but this is how we came to the office. So any ideas, any thoughts about how or why someone who has had no rehab can do this kind of uh, outcome, which is very hard to, hard to explain, right? All right, moving on. So- um, H.I., just one quick question, maybe from the audience too, is it, yeah. It, it, when, when we have a flexor tendon, it, you know, we find an adjacent flexor to, to um, use. Yeah. Uh, and I, I would assume in this instance, the FPL muscle wasn't good, or did you use that? Or I used FPL FPL muscle, yes. So, so I yeah. used FPL muscle because uh, I, I, I was uh, pleased with the quality of it. It was reacting to stimulation, so I felt it was still usable. Okay, so, good. Uh, this is a, um, I think, 52-year-old lady. And you can see on the, left of, on the right of the screen is a good thumb. And on the left of the screen is the thumb from the side on which she had a distal radius fracture. So we talked about this. And at this stage, um, how would you approach it, Kevin? Would you, uh, would you try to take care of the distal radius fracture first? It's about eight, 12 weeks, would you mobilize her first and wait and do this later? Um, would you advise her to just wait and see if she even needs something doing? Well, I don't think there's any real urgency to act. Right. Uh, if, right. if the fracture is eight to 12 weeks old, right. uh, you know, I think you're perfectly appropriate to go ahead and act now. You know, it's well documented that EPL tendon ruptures can occur with distal radius fractures and oftentimes it's the more benign appearing distal radius fractures that are treated non-operatively. Uh, that you seem to see that, you know, particularly yeah. now that we're all so diligent or we should be so diligent with our placement to avoid dorsal cortical penetration with our distal uh, screw, right. screw hole or plate. Uh, but then it really becomes when uh, when's appropriate. Now, you do want to make sure that the wrist isn't too stiff. Yes. Uh, when you're going to uh, act upon uh, reconstruction here, uh, because, you know, it can be difficult to determine your tenodesis and the correct tensioning. Uh, on your uh, tendon reconstruction uh, if the wrist is very stiff. So if yes. she needs to get into a little rehab to get uh, her wrist mobilizing, uh, I think that that would be appropriate. Uh, and then you can 
uh, go through the reconstruction process if she's uh, you know needing better thumb extension for whatever activity she's involved in. So if I hear you correctly, I for the audience, I got two points. Number one, uh, it is okay to wait and mobilize the wrist and make it as supple as possible. And number two, I heard you say that if she needs a reconstruction, which means there is a subset of patients, I'm guessing from your remark, who may not want or need it. Well, for sure. I mean, if it's uh, someone who's low physical demand, uh, ill and firm, not a good surgical candidate, or you know, when you talk to them, what the rehabilitation protocol is going to be afterwards, if they're if they say I'm not going to do any of that, yeah, uh, then I think yeah. they have self select self selected themselves for uh, non operative management with uh, right. an absent right. PPL. Right. Okay. Perfect. So uh, let's say it's now we are at five months. She's done all the rehabbing, and Becky's done a remarkable job on her. She's got a fully supple wrist, but says, Doc, I really want something done. What's your go-to uh, tendon? Well, for me, this is a, a, a single stage EIP to EPL tendon transfer. Okay, so here we are. Again, listening to what Kevin is telling us, this is the way I test the EIP. Is there any different technique that you test the EIP? No, I think that's a, an appropriate way to test the EIP. And, and I think that you know, EIP ruptures uh, are going to be pretty uncommon, and EIP absence also, I think, going to be very uncommon. Very uncommon, true. So I use those incisions, they are a little larger, but the reason I'm showing this slide again from Amit Gupta, thank you, Amit, is that we are always taught that the junctura come from the ring finger, go to the middle and small, and usually the index finger is spared. But the reason I'm showing you this slide is because of this. Although there's no classic junctura, there's oftentimes very dense transverse bands between the middle and the index finger tendons, and they can go to both the EDC or the EIP. And they physically need to be divided if you're trying to pull the EIP through in the proximal wound. So how do you find, uh, is there any trick used to finding the EIP uh, in the wrist, Kevin? Well, in the wrist, uh, it is typically the deepest structure within the fourth compartment and also has the most uh, distal muscle belly. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good indication. And then distally, uh, it is the ulnar of the two uh, extensor tendon insertions onto the ulnar hood. So uh, here, as you have identified, you know, your EIP and EDC, and then doing some manual fraction there, you can find uh, approximately which structure is gliding. So you know you've got the right one as well. Perfect. So I usually tend to withdraw them and pass it subcutaneously. Do you do anything differently when you pass it? Nope, I, I do the same thing. I bring it... <laughs> proximal to the extensor retinaculum uh, through that same dorsal incision that you have and then create a subcutaneous tunnel uh, to the thumb metacarpal uh, where okay. we've already identified the, uh, the more proximal aspect of the distal EPL stump. And how do you uh, do your distal anastomosis? Are you still a pulver taft guy or have you uh, switched sides and gone to the side to side brown tenorophy? Uh, I like Jeff, uh, am also a pulver taft guy and it's what I was trained on and I've not had one fail me yet. So yeah. Uh, so it works. This is what I do. I do a pulver taft distally, but since the tendon is usually so long on both sides, I do a side to side proximally. For, just because it's there. I call that a bipolar repair. It's strong and uh, I can afford to get them moving reasonably quickly. So uh, setting tension. Um, how, how about setting tension? What's your... Uh, What's your guidelines for setting tension? You know, this is really the art of, of what we do, you know, and, and, you know, there is certainly some science behind it, uh, but, you know, trying to gauge uh, your resting tension and, you know, there's all sorts of little uh, techniques, you know, pulling uh, the motor uh, to 100% tension and then backing off about 50%. Uh, and, and typically, since I'm a pulver tap guy, I'll make one pass and uh, put yes. it, secure it with a, uh, more of a figure of eight suture and test the tension with tenodesis. The figure of eight suture is easier to remove if your tension right. is incorrect. Yeah. And then the rest of my sutures are a, a mattress technique because that creates less tissue ischemia. At the, uh, right, right. Yeah, so that's exactly what I've done here. Uh, setting it so that when the wrist comes down to neutral, you get complete thumb extension. And uh, when you flex the wrist, you should be able to take the thumb almost to the pinky, but not quite. So here she's on day four and she's already actively extending the thumb. And the one thing, this is just me being nitpicky, I put on my own casts if I'm gonna cast them for two weeks. And uh, so we, we use this technique and we should, with the bipolar repair, 
and we found that it was very effective in giving a reasonable outcome. But the question I have now is uh, moving on to something like this. So, um, is uh, Harry, are you still around? Still around. How I would you approach someone like this? Can you see this? Yes. What do you think? She's 65. She's got a diagnosis of rheumatoid. She's been through a different, you know, multiple sets of DMARs, not very effectively. Most of her symptoms have calmed down, but the wrist was not doing that great. And then she came in with this suddenly. This is a, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the Vaughn Jackson and, and you know, the, the original description, interestingly enough, was in rheumatoid, not osteoarthritis. We sort of associated right. with osteoarthritis at this point uh, as the pathology at the level of the uh, DREJ and the dorsal yeah. aspect. Of, but, you, you know, the original description was, um, was actually in rheumatoid arthritis. And right. as, as most of these things, they were sort of post-mortem or after the fact. So I, I think this is what, uh, to a certain extent, you're dealing with here is not only a mechanical issue at the DREJ, but also because of the rheumatoid arthritis and the proliferative nature of it, uh, an issue of the intrinsic integrity of the tendon, vascularity of the tendon, the watershed, all the things you mentioned in the talk initially. So there, uh, I always get worried when I see that because I know there's a little work to be done because uh, that looks like a large amount of synovial hypertrophy, which fits in with the picture that we are seeing, right? Yes. And, uh, and, you know, and, and it's always worse. Okay. Yes. In other words, you know, if there's two ruptured, the third one is just about. Yes. Uh, if there's one ruptured, there's another two, one or two yeah. that are have, uh, that that are, that are an issue as well. That's an extremely important point for the audience. And uh, whenever you enter these cases, just like Harry said, be prepared for more than what is visible. So here we are, and. Uh, the black arrow is showing the rent in the DRUJ capsule, and there's the spicule that was sawing through the tendons. And there's the synovial hypertrophy distally. So now what, Harry, what do I do now? What, what is your so, view? Well, it's, it's, you know, take inventory at this point, right? So it's, you can hear the thunder in the background, I'm out on the porch here. Uh, is, uh, it looks like the extensor to the index is intact, but potentially both the yeah. EDC and the EIP. And yeah. potentially also to the middle finger, it's intact, or are both of those to the index finger? Middle and finger so was okay. Is, yeah. So it's a, I think it's the options are, and you discussed them. This is graft or transfer. In most of these instances, it's a combination of both. If you have enough, um, I would personally use the EIP to both of those uh, rather than side to side um, uh, and remove as much of the proliferative tissue as possible, address the DREJ, remove the osteophyte that is offending. Uh, attempt to close the dorsal capsule of the uh, DREJ, manage it appropriately from a pharmacologic standpoint, um, those sort of things. It, it becomes a little more tricky when there is less, don't, fewer donors, right? Yes. And then a graft is necessary and the motor power can be another muscle if it's just occurred. I've done that. Um, yes. In other words, as you mentioned for the, the FPL or one of the wrist extensors, which isn't outstanding because of excursion. And then finally, uh, a wrist flexor because it's mm -hmm. uh, in that sort of tenodesis right. uh, phase. Uh, and that's sort of, I think, of order of priority um, uh, for me here. So that's what we did. We, uh, I, I chose to go uh, side to side to the middle finger for the ring finger, and I yep. transferred the EIP to the pinky and set tension. Uh, shortly after surgery, she developed other comorbidities took over, and she was in rehab, never did a day of... Uh, a rehabilitation and here she's at six weeks with uh, absolutely no difficulty so the question is why did she do so well Becky what do you think so I honestly think that inherently the extensors are easier and I think if you get the tension correctly and she's and quite frankly I think with tendon repairs and tendon transfers we know our cheaters do quite well mm -hmm. um, so my thought for this woman is if she is not overly active, if she was taking it carefully, did a little bit of motion on her own, you had nice strong repairs that were gliding well and had good tension. I don't think extensors are that difficult. I don't think they need to be over rehabilitated. And I think with some simple exercise, they actually turn out quite well. And that's exactly what happened to her because she was just guarding it because she was in, in, in rehab for her other medical comorbidities. 
But in addition, Dr. Leffert had shown us that if you transfer tendons on the extensive side, they start working almost uh, as intended by us in the new position. So, uh, and we know that from extensive tendon repairs, as well as Dr. Gelberman's study on flexor tendon repairs, that you start rehabilitation early, like Becky said. Uh, that's great. But what about tendon transfers? Well, we know from uh, Santosh Rath and Gunter Gehrman that early rehab reduces rehab time and is cost effective and complications do not increase. So here's someone else. This is exactly what Harry was talking about. One finger dropped. There's the syn synovial hypertrophy. And when we got in there, much like Harry wanted us to be aware of, there was one more tendon gone. So here she is. And apologies, Dr. Shekhar, I did a DARA. And the, the hole here is for the ECU tenodesis. So. Hey, uh, Chai. Yes. Uh, one, of the, one of the things is in these situations, <clears throat> You have to look at the risk. If there is ulnar translocation, you have to be careful doing a DARA. You, you probably have to stabilize the, um, you know, lunate to the radius. Yes, do a that's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. So in, in her, uh, she didn't have that. So I was comfortable doing it. And I have to try this is assess the other wrist. I'll Some say that again, I didn't hear you. Do you assess the opposite wrist? Yes. So if they already have a you know a tendon involvement in one side, um, I'll go ahead and do studies, at least x-rays. If they have arth arthritic symptoms, I'll get a CT looking for a dorsal osteophyte because oftentimes they'll have it. They won't have a tendon issue yet. Yeah. Just thought your thoughts about that. Yes. So I do assess the opposite wrist. I don't get a CT. I just get plain radiographs. That's all. And I feel for crepitation in the vicinity of the fifth compartment. And if there is any, or if they have a synovial hypertrophy, then I will... Uh, urge them to have an early debridement done, especially if there's not been a change in DMARDs uh, recently. If there's been a change in DMARDs recently, then I give the DMARDs anywhere between eight and 12 weeks to make the effect. Okay. Chai, Yo. it's Chuck. Hi. Hey, Chuckles. Uh, just a couple of points. I, the original Von Jackson was actually described in conjunction with osteoarthritis, uh, a couple yes. of lab laborers, and it's subsequently, we know it as uh, associated with rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Yes. If, uh, you, uh, you can have tendon ruptures over a DARA, so it's very important to uh, to shave down the, the end, make sure the end, end is smooth, right. uh, you get right. secondary ruptures. And the third is Emmett mentioned a radial lunate fusion, but if a patient has really good wrist motion and they have owner translocation, they may not want to have restriction of motion. And that's an, an, uh, an opportunity to do a Save Kapanji, which I don't do very often, but that could also stabilize the carpus and solve the problem. True. True. Uh, but usually when you have this Vaughn Jackson in the setting of rheumatoid, at least the ones that I've seen and taken care of, it's instability of the DRUJ because of the Capitalne syndrome. And uh, I oftentimes find that it's very hard for me to uh, keep that ulna back because the TFCC is also destroyed. So I don't know if I'm going to be able to solve the problem with the survey Kapanji, you know, that's my yeah. worry. Yeah, well, w once you dissociate the ulna, you can put the ulna head wherever you want, really. That's true. <laughs> that is true. Okay, one last case before we hand it off to Paul. Here's a, a male. I'm describing the mechanism that I talked to about in gymnasts. He was working on a high-speed uh, drill on an oil rig out in the middle of uh, the sea, just off the coast of Galveston. And his glove got caught on the, on the drill. And he was seen in the emergency room with this painful swelling on the top of his wrist. He came to see me two weeks later, but he had no finger extension. Any guesses what may have happened? Hey, Tom, you're close to Galveston. What do you think? Well, Chai, um... I am close to Galveston, and I know gymnast. He doesn't look like he's probably uh, a gymnast. <laughs> as well, but, uh, you know, I would think it would be some sort of avulsion. I, uh, so there he is, the hands to the right, the elbows to the left, and Tom is absolutely correct. When we pulled on, when we pulled on this mass here and gently pulled on it, and that's what came out. Now, here we are faced with the situation, Tom. Do you think this is something we can salvage and repair, or... Are you going to go to plan B, C, D? And this is acute, I'm sure. So um, This is about two and a half weeks. Two and a half weeks. 
I don't know. It looks to me like a musculotendinous junction rupture, right? Yeah, exactly. And to me, that would be a difficult thing to salvage, but yeah. I've never seen it. Yeah. So I thought exactly like you. My, then my question is, now what do I do? Uh, at this point, I guess you have to start thinking about transfers. That's exactly what we did. We took his FCR. And because this was an avulsion, I did end-to-end -end transfer. And that was his original track of his EDC. And we got it to the FCR. So um, again, Becky, how would you rehab this person? Yeah, this is, these are some of my favorite ones to rehab, actually, because it's very simple. So you know that with wrist flexion, you can create digit extension. So you're really using your tenodesis approach. And yeah. patients, I would even say older patients, can get this pretty easily. So this is a very, this is a lovely transfer. And in, in rehab, it's, it's quite nice to do. And the synergy also helps you, exactly like you said. Mm -hmm. So here he is, not surprisingly, at 10 weeks, he was back to working on the oil rig and with a reasonable outcome. So with that in mind, take home messages. Ruptures happen in rheumatoid distal radius fractures after open reduction or spontaneous. Primary repair usually doesn't work. Uh, graft versus transfer, surgeon's choice. And if the plate has soon grade two, I'd better off taking it out. So with that being said, I will stop sharing and I will hand it off to Paul. Paul, all yours, buddy. Thanks, Chai. The, those were amazing cases. So I'm going to talk now about ulnar artery perforator flaps. So conflicts, these are the previously circulated objectives. This is an 84-year-old who presents um, one week after a extravasation injury of dopamine, he went into um, heart block and had a right antecubital fossa IV. And about day two, he started to complain of pain and they pulled the IV. And this is about day seven. And he actually got a pacemaker put in and he got put on some antiplatelets and he got his heart block corrected, but he's left with this full thickness um, eschar. This is um, just like leather right there. And you can see it's all the subcutaneous tissue is gone. His biceps tendon is sitting right there. He also has a history of colitis um, and he's previously had uh, abdominal surgery and he's a non-insulin dependent diabetic. So this is our, you can think about this as we go through um, and come back to it at the end and about the different options available because he needs soft tissue coverage, particularly across his elbow joint so he doesn't develop a flexion contracture as well as he's gonna need coverage of his biceps tendon. So this uh, picture is from a wonderful upcoming book called The Grasping Hand Structure and Functional Anatomy of the Hand and Upper Extremity. It's from Amit. And if we look at the ulnar artery, um, we can see the smooth course coming off the uh, brachial artery. And we know that um, the courses divides off and the radial artery continues and the common interosseous comes, and then it runs down to the wrist and forms the superficial arch. So that's sort of the gross overview of the um, artery. But in reality, it's not quite that. It's a little bit different. Let me just... So if you take the form and you inject it full of latex, then you get this picture and the wrist is to your right and the elbows to your left. 
and you can see the ulnar artery at the top of your screen and the radial artery at the bottom. And there's a whole uh, plexus of vessels, including uh, vessels or branches coming off uh, and leaving the ulnar artery and the radial artery. And you can see interconnections between those uh, branches of the ulnar artery. And you can see the subdermal vascular network and you can see connections between the two of them. So the vascular anatomy is a little more prolific and complex. And if you go to a cadaver specimen, and this uh, uh, article for this is listed below, and if you're interested in this, it's a really good article. And you can again see the, the hand to the right of your screen, elbow to the left. Uh, you can see these branches coming off the artery um, the ulnar artery that allows you to identify them here going up to the skin and there's a, a whole bunch of them um, and you can also notice that that's the FDS is over here and the FCU and there's a separation between the two of them where these vessels run up to the skin. Now there are vessels that can run through the muscle as well up to the skin but you can see all these vessels and this um, should make you think sorry a little stuck think of the radial artery and perforator flaps off the radial artery and this is from Michael St. Cyr's article so this is the radial artery but the concept is the same you have a bunch of vessels you can flip them proximally and distally so that you can move flaps, you can divide the artery, you can do a radial form flap to cover the elbow, and you can do a reverse radial form flap to cover the hand. So that's routine. So you can do the same thing with the ulnar artery. It's been described, uh, ulnar artery flaps have been described for elbow coverage, reverse ulnar artery flaps have been described for hand coverage, free ulnar artery flaps based upon perforators have been described as well. So you can do the same thing. Um, it's nothing sort of new, it's just something we don't do as commonly. So now what I wanna do is, now that we understand there's a bunch of perforators that come off and we can raise different flaps, I wanna discuss and focus a little bit more on one perforator and down in the distal form, approximately four to five centimeters, depending upon who you read, um, there's a perforator that comes off the ulnar artery and it goes underneath the FCU to describe the, to supply the uh, ulnar border of the form. So just to orient you a little bit, here's the FCU, it's been retracted. Here's the ECU up here. This right here is the ulnar artery. This is the ulnar nerve right behind it. This is the dorsal sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And there's this perforator coming off and it's sending up a branch. And this branch goes all the way to the dorsum of the metacarpals. And it also wise or sends another branch that runs up into the dorsal proximal form at this level. And some people call this the dorsal ulnar artery. And this is the vessel that was described by uh, Becker and Gilbert for this flap back in 1988 that has subsequently frequently been called the uh, Becker flap. So in this paper, they did uh, dissected 100 fresh forms. Um, they demonstrated a skin or fascial flap that was placed on this dorsal ulnar artery, which passes underneath the flexor carpi ulnaris. They were able to demonstrate supply to the distal two thirds of the ulnar side of the form, and it covers defects of the hand, both dorsal and palmar, the wrist. It's been used uh, for median nerve coverage, the thenars and the hypothenars. I'd want to add one other thing that in subsequent uh, dissections and cases, sometimes this vessel actually comes off the anterior interosseous artery. Um, so, but that's in a very small percentage of cases. So 
I'm going to expand a little bit. So this is the same drawing. And I told you that this vessel here goes distal and goes over to the dorsum of the metacarpals. Well, as the ulnar artery comes more distally, it goes to supply the hypotheners and branches from the hypotheners pass through an anastomose with this same vessel. So in fact, there's retrograde circulation is possible if you divide this here. And so if you're interested in other uh, a variation on this flap, you can actually elevate a Becker flap, divide this pedicle right here and use retrograde flow through the flap. And that will allow you to reach this flap further than leaving this vessel attached. It's this connection of the descending branch of the dorsal ulnar artery with vessels from the hypotheners as well as over the metacarpals and the deep metacarpals that allows retrograde flow back up into this flap. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to run a video to show a running uh, elevation of the Becker flap. And just to uh, get you a little bit oriented, because now everything's sort of flipped over. So of course, the extensor carpi ulnaris is going to be over here. The flexor carpi ulnaris will be um, on the top of your screen. And you'll see it gets retracted away. And the vessel you're going to see is going to come right up here. And that's going to allow you to raise this flap because part of the vessel will run up and part will run down. So the vessel will run up like this. And then it also runs up into this area here. So for the traditional Becker flap, this vessel, which then continues over here and receives branches coming this way. For the traditional flap, you're going to divide this. If you want to extend it, then what you would do is cut this off the ulnar artery, and that would allow retrograde flow to come up into your flap and also allow you to dissect further and essentially pivot your flap all the way down here to get it further distally. So now uh, we're going to go to the next slide. And now we're going to run this video. The Becker flap is based on a branch of the ulnar artery, which comes off uh, proximal uh, and it supplies the dorsal ulnar aspect of the hand. And you can take a long uh, flaps of uh, skin paddle with it. Um, so it's relying, it's relying on a branch of the ulnar artery. So we're going to try and take a lot more fascia with it. These are veins we take up, we take out, and uh, you can doppler these vessels so you'll be able to get an idea where the vessel is.
FCs, FC, FC. Hmm? Yeah. Do you want to get on the FC tab? Mm -hmm. okay. the sensory branch of the ulnar nerve. And the branch going across here. So here's the uh, <clears throat> branch from the ulnar artery, which is uh, supplying the perforators to the uh, skin skin flap. Um, and this is the skin flap going on. You can use this flap to cover the carpal tunnel, uh, back of the hand, ulnar side of the 
uh, hand. So it's a very uh, versatile flap uh, based on the branch of the other option. Okay. So that's the Becker flap. And now if we uh, go back to our 84 year old, and this was him at uh, seven days after his uh, dopamine extravasation injury. And so um, there's a bunch of different options that might be used to get the coverage for him. And um, unfortunately we didn't get him right to the OR because this happened at, um, during the height of uh, COVID-19. We had a little bit of a delay. By the time we got him to the OR, this is where he's at. And we can um, Doppler out perforators from his ulnar artery. And that's what we've done is use the Doppler to pinpoint those perforators. And then we'll be able to debride this uh, necrotic tissue, raise a long flap based upon those perforators, swing that flap to cover over his cubal fossa, and as well, um, then just skin graft everything else. So this is the uh, intraoperative picture where we've elevated the flap, turned it across, and then we just skin grafted everything else. And he's now uh, eight weeks post-op. His wounds are all healed and he's uh, regained all his motion in his elbow. And that flap was based upon proximal perforators of the ulnar artery. So that's um, perforators of the ulnar artery and all the different, uh, you can imagine, permutations and combinations. And now I'm going to turn the screen back over to Chai. Thank you, Paul. That was, uh, you know, I, I love seeing the stuff that you guys do. So, uh, you know, I'm, I should ask uh, Amit, I, I, I saw that video and I heard you talking about it. But if you had a choice, would you prefer flaps based off uh, the radial artery or the ulnar artery? Because it seems like the, the radial artery flaps seem to be more robust. Would you, would you agree or am I wrong? No, no, no. This, this flap is very robust. This um, uh, Gilbert flap, it's, it's a constant vessel mm -hmm. and it gives a long um, you know, a subdermal plexus uh, connection, lots of connection as Paul has clearly shown from the paper that he uh, uh, showed. And it, you can take this flap very far proximally and it will survive. I and see. I've taken it all the way up to the elbow also. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very robust flap. I prefer this flap to, um, you know, if you, to taking a, say, a radial forearm flap. Um, uh -huh. I particularly dislike for that flap, as you know. Uh, <laughs> But I, I would not be uh, averse to taking perforated flaps from the radial artery. Yeah. Okay. So but let me ask you this. Artery is, a problem. is this flap, um, forgive my ignorance, but can this flap be harvested with the segment of the ulna, much like the radial artery forearm flap can be done? It, it probably can, but I've never done it. Um, and the ulna at that point is very um, cortical. And, right. you know, um, you know, I don't I haven't looked at the vascularity of the of the bone uh, in that sense, but I suppose it can. Paul, what do you think? So there is a, a cadaver study um, that shows that yes, you can take the portion of the distal or you know a wedge piece of the distal ulna. But I, I'm with Amit. I mm -hmm. mean, I'd be pretty nervous. We all know what happens or the risk of non-union uh, associated with ulnar shortening, but it's been described anatomically. So I, I was looking at that case you showed, uh, Paul, the one with the 84 year old with the dopamine extravasation. And I understand what you did, why you did. Let's say that was a 24 year old with a traumatic uh, injury. Would, you, would your choice of flap been different? Would you have gone to a free ALT 
or would you have been would it have been something different for that location for me personally yeah no i, I would have probably stuck with that flap okay because um i mean i guess um uh, so i haven't sacrificed a major artery I haven't created a donor site defect or scar in some other extremity. Um, there's no doubt it's not pretty, but considering it's only ugly in one part of the body. Now, so let me ask Jay. Jay, what would you do? Well, in that... Uh, in that setting, you know, other described flaps include a... Um, like a brachioradialis flap. I don't know, uh, based on the necrosis, if there was, you know, a segment of the brachioradialis that was uh, involved in that necrosis, and though that might eliminate. But that 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 is one muscle belly that you could sacrifice. It's in a similar concept. You're not sacrificing a major vessel. It's a local uh, muscle that you could detach from the radial styloid, and then you can mobilize that to the antecubital fossa. Hmm. Um, there's also been described FCU muscle flaps. Yes, that's what I was coming to. One question I had about the, the perforator flap, um, which I thought was an awesome dissection, and I don't have much clinical experience with that, but are there ever concerns for congestion, like the post-operative care of that flap? Can you give us some more information about what to anticipate? Like, are there issues with the size of it that you might have some uh, wound edge, uh, you know, uh, ischemia or... Do you ever need to use leeches or is there other issues with the flap that are unique to that flap? No, for the, for the uh, Becker flap, again, it's a very good flap. And as long as you've not, um, you know, uh, completely skeletonized the uh, perforator pedicle, I think you're fine. Um, sometimes you can get these superficial veins. And uh, if you have one or two superficial veins and you're taking a long flap, uh, it's it's worthwhile taking the superficial vein and doing a quick anastomosis under the loops. So that will okay. give you an extra venous drainage. And with elevation, I have not had much problems with these uh, ulnar artery flaps, really. Good to know. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jay mentioned the FCU flap. Uh, Dennis Orgel from the Brigham was a big champion of that particular flap using the FCU. Do either of you use that for coverage of anterior elbow defects? Sammy Roku's uh, wrote up the, you know, Sammy, you know, uh, yes. our, uh, uh, from Lebanon. Lebanon, yeah. yeah. He wrote up the, uh, the anatomy and the clinical use of this flap. Um, he used to uh, work in Paris and uh, with Massoulin, and uh, <clears throat> he had written up some of this stuff. So I've been talking to him. I've, I've never, ever done that flap, but it's, uh, it's an intriguing little flap. Okay. So, uh, uh, Chai, Chai, I've, I've done the flap. It's Chuck or Joanne. Um, <laughs> it's great for rheumatoids who have a fused wrist <laughs> and uh, a total elbow with a, a wound. So they don't, they don't need their FCU. Right. Um, their problem is it's gracile. It's, if you flip it to cover the elbow, it's, it's long, but it's, it's narrow. Yes. Um, but it, it, that's a one minor indication. If you use it to try and cover an elbow, it's going to, Across an indicator, you said it's gracile. How do you get around that? What do you do different? Well, it depends on what what you need. So, uh, in a, in these couple of instances, I've used the Ankeny, an Ankeneus flap with an FCU, combine them, and that has provided adequate coverage. Okay. So, if it's along the length of the incision this yeah. way, it, it'll work well. So, if it's draped this way, but if it has to go across, it's not going to be good. Okay. Right to cover it to get to the antecubital so, area, it's not good. So in the right. antecubital area, um, as Paul mentioned, perforator flaps from you know either the radial or the ulnar artery, proximal ones, uh, would work well as he's shown. But I mean, if it's a big area, then perhaps for me, uh, I would probably do a free flap. Yeah. Or okay. a reverse lateral arm flap, which you showed too. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's right. So on that note, we are going to uh, move on to. Uh, the ending of this session. We have two more sessions in this must know series. We've been doing this for 12 weeks. We've got two more sessions to go. And in the Sage on stage, we've got another three sessions to go. So um, as in keeping with the past sessions, I think we need to give a shout out to those of uh, 
the people in AO North America who helped make this a great success. The final shout out goes to uh, Steve Schwartz, the executive director of AO North America for marshalling the troops and producing this whole thing and making it work so well. So thank you, Steve. Um, for those of you who wonder what will happen when we are done with Must Know series on July 23rd and uh, the Sage on Stage on August 18th. Well, we have a lot of stuff coming along in the pipeline. In September, we hope to start didactics for uh, resident and fellow education. And thanks to Chuck and Marco, the Advanced Risk Summit, uh, which was supposed to be an in-person event in uh, late October, will now be done as a virtual event spaced out over a period of several weeks. But if you keep tuning into this every week, you'll get more details as we uh, come up with them. So with that being said, next week we'll have Jeff Lawton talking to us about tenant transfers for radial nerve palsy. And Michael Saints here is going to talk to us about the flavor of the month, the ALT flap. Thank you, Max. And uh, thank you, Angel. So with that being said, I want to thank all of you for uh, joining together tonight. We really appreciate the fact that you take time out of your lives to come and join us. We hope you all are being safe. Thank you and good night.